Hello. How the hell are you? Fine. I, I, wait, let me put my ears in. So I'm, I'm actually going to keep working. I'm working, I'm doing some weaving, so I'm going to keep going. Um, but I'll listen in. I'll be listening. When are you leaving? No, I'm just, I'm just doing some weaving. And oh, I. I I only have a little light left before the end of the day, so I'm going to keep going. <laughs> oh, we weeding like like the garden or something. Weaving. Oh, weaving. <laughs> well, don't they have electricity up there in Quebec? Yeah, but the light—it's always the daylight that works. The, I have, you know, it, it doesn't work with artificial light. It doesn't, it's not great. So okay. <laughs> I only weave okay. in daylight. Do you, ha uh, do you have anything you could show us that you? Well, I just have this thing that I'm working on, which is, uh, um, so it's a silk scarf that I'm working on. Ah, and that, is that like the first thing that you've done? No, it's the second thing. I did a sampler first, uh, just to sort of try out different patterns. So this is the first real thing that I'm doing. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So, so the artist needs the proper light to. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, I can dig it. And it'll Thanks. make noise, so I'll shut out the. Uh, I'll shut up. Oh, it isn't a it it isn't a foot pedal like. No, it's an all hand thing. Well, I can't. It doesn't, I, make, it doesn't make a lot of noise. It's just that. Uh, oh, the the bar is going like this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, I had uh, I don't know a long long time ago. Somebody I knew had one. I think they, I think they wove me a scarf, but <laughs> I still have this. A and she was uh, from Vancouver, British Columbia, uh -huh. but it was uh, oh so many years ago. So I don't. If I saw her in the street, I wouldn't even recognize her. You know? So you can hear the sound. It's just the leaves. Oh, oh yeah. It's just the leaves going up and down. Clacking. Yeah. yeah. Clack, yeah. clack, clack. Well, there's Doug's brain. You don't. <laughs> uh, oh, there he is. Uh, hello. Hello. What's up, Douglas? Just hanging, hanging, hanging in the teen section at the library. Oh, at the library. Is it a school library or a, a city library? The county. County library. And there's the poet. Does he know it? I think so. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I think uh, uh, from a, uh, on occasion he's called himself a poet. Yes, he has. Yeah. He's a brave man. Having <laughs> <laughs> uh, technical difficulties with my microphone and audio setup. Can you hear me okay? No. Not very well. And uh, Ed, you're a little foggy. I'm foggy? Foggy. Oh. Okay. Let, uh, me see, let me see if I can do something. Is it dark there in uh, 
Oh, it's dark here. It gets dark here about four o'clock. And and it's much it's later. It's eight o'clock now. It's eight o'clock. Eight o'clock. Yeah. It gets light about eight thirty. Oh my! But the what's shortest the, day is coming. <laughs> what's the uh, what's the parallel line? The latitude. Yeah. The latitude? yeah. yeah. We're I'm, we're at about fifty degrees. Oh, that's but, way up there. Well, we're st- we're south of London. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't remember London. I, I lived in England for two years yeah. when I was a kid, and I don't remember the yeah, weather. It's, it's further. Yeah, it's further north. Uh, Scotland is. Uh, it's starting to get Scandinavian. Uh, you know, uh, I just. Uh, I just heard from my brothers, whose son, my nephew's in, in the Marines, and he's doing his Arctic training in uh, northern Norway. He's up near the Arctic Circle, and he's, they have six hours of twilight a day. Uh-huh. <laughs> it, it never gets really light. <laughs> yeah, that's, so he, that's, uh, yeah, that's he's not, Alaska-like. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the other place they send him, but he was on this, uh, they had this big NATO maneuver you know, going on, so he was there for that. Now they're now they're testing a new Arctic gear. <laughs> they're, they're keeping an eye on the Russians, are they? I don't know. I, all as I know is that when I hear him speak of the military, it sounds a lot like the military I was in. I don't think some things have changed all that much. <laughs> yeah. Weapons have gotten better. Yeah, they've gotten better, but the. The situation, I think, is pretty standard. It's, I, don't, I don't think it's ever really changed. You know, a lot of boredom. A lot of crappy food. A lot of sitting or Yeah, sitting around. A lot of, a lot of sitting around. They but, don't have anywhere to, you know. But they have they, porn they, now. The porn is way better. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, well, well, back in the day, you know, if you didn't have a projector, you know, you needed to film you had a room electricity it was, you know it was awful black and white magazine <laughs> yeah yeah that hasn't changed either i'm sure <laughs> okay well that's not why we're here to discuss uh life in the military <laughs> any anyway yeah you got rid of the fog it's much okay yeah I, I have a i usually have a, a little sticky thing that's over the camera and so sometimes I, I misplace it and I get the glue on there and I have to clean it off every once in a while. So I'm, if I'm out of the fog, at least externally, I can assure you that inside it's just as it was. <laughs> Cloud of unknowing. Well, that would be nice if we got that far. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the goals we've got set. Uh, get at least to there. Well, yeah. Do we need a count? Do we need a countdown to start? I don't know. How are we going to do this? What do you think, Doug? Well, it looks like it's already recording, so the countdown doesn't necessarily. The countdown need to is already occur. already taken effect, and I, I think the person that, yeah. that that called the meeting should start. So, just to let you guys know. I'm listening, but I'm working on my weaving because while well, there's still light outside, so <laughs> if somebody asks for me, I'll I'll come back in. But uh, otherwise, I'll be hanging in the okay. background. <laughs> well, just briefly, uh, Jeffrey, did you have you read that book or or I have read any... about half of it? Oh, uh, okay, it, it did go quickly, but I have had other things to do, so I haven't been able to read it all. But uh, but it is a lovely book, I have to say, so I will finish it. It's not the kind of book you want to speed through, either. No. no. And on the little video, I think, um, Mark, you put it up. Um, the first of her two readings is the one I read, and the other one I hadn't. But uh, yeah, yeah, the other one is near the back of the book. Yes. Yeah. Like, yeah. 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 Well, which, I found, which I found really fascinating. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Take it away, Doug. So I didn't necessarily propose the idea, but I did post the cafe topic 
So I, I, I don't mind starting out and maybe uh, passing the, the torch off to Marco, who did propose the, the actual reading. Um, and your audio is much better now, Marco, from the few words you've, your, your pithy response earlier. So, um, But I, I guess I can give a history of how I came about the book, which ties in with the actual reason why John Ames wrote the book, but I had started writing letters to quite a few people, which I mentioned. Can anyone hear me at this point? Oh, yeah. yeah. It, it just threw me because okay. the author of the book was, was Robinson, and you said John Ames. John Ames was the actual preacher, or whatever you call them. He's the, he's the, char- he's the main character of the book who is doing oh. the writing of the letters. Oh, okay. um, but I took a pause there. Um, I'm double checking to make sure you can hear me. Everybody's video is frozen right now. So you can hear me? Yes. 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 Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. So I guess it's the video frozen here. Um, so. We did lose you there. All right. <laughs> I'm not understanding why I have full service here, but uh, I'll continue on. And if uh, I can't be understood, then yell at me or uh, mute me and take over. Um, but I had started writing letters to individuals in my life, my mother, my father, friends. And I also had the idea um, to write letters to my my son, who at the time was not speaking just yet. So I, I couldn't directly verbally have a conversation with him. So I was thinking, well, I'll, I'll spend my time uh, writing to him. And then one of my friends, who happens to be a preacher, his name isn't John Ames, but he, he recommended highly this book, at, uh, perhaps his favorite book. He said it's one of his favorites. And when I started reading it, I said, well, this is pretty cool. It parallels with uh, kind of what I'm doing here. Although I'm not dying as the main character um, states that he is approaching the end of his days and wants to get out some information to his son, who who's, sounds like he's seven, eight, nine. I can't remember the exact age. So he's not. he can have a conversation with this son, but he's un- unable to discuss theology, discuss philosophy, discuss kind of the deeper uh, aspects of life. John Ames seems to be a deep thinker. Um, He's definitely Christian. And, but at the same time, he, he's well read. He starts off the, um, the first few pages of the book, Uh, uh, his, his brother, his older brother, Edward has knowledge uh, who is a self-proclaimed atheist uh, going against this long line of preachers from John Ames, uh, his father and his father before him, his grandfather, uh, all, were all preachers. And so Edward um, introduces quite a few books to um, the author or the, the writer of the letters, uh, John Ames. And that kind of opens, even though Gilead is a a small town, even though this is a kind of hole in the wall, so to speak, town in which his his brother Edward extracts himself from this small town. Um, Even though John Ames is in this, it just makes the decision to stay in this town and be a preacher in a small town. Um, he is perhaps more well-read than what you would imagine any other preacher in a small town would be. He's, he's read quite a few authors um, on both sides of the aisle. And, but I, without going into full discussion here, um, essentially the book is these letters that he's writing to his young son. Um, and, there, 
is essentially not much plot. It, it meanders as perhaps an older man's mind might meander or a person writing letters to their son would meander. Um, so there is that sort of rhythm throughout the book that's flowing from one thought to the next. So it, there is some coherence and near the end of the book, there is quite a bit of a, a plot that develops in a certain sense, um, at least that ties together the present aspects of um, a few individuals that are introduced and ties in the past with the present. Um, but I, I think I'll stop there. I think others would have a bit more to say than I do about the actual content of the book. So maybe I'll pass it off to you, Marco. You, you made the proposal. I, I'm wondering uh, how you came about reading this book or hearing about it. You are muted. Okay, so my audio is okay now. I think after yes, Christmas, I, I might have a better setup. Uh, we use an Amazon wish list uh, with my uh, in-laws and <laughs> my my wife's mother just but does her Christmas shopping from Amazon wish list. Our Amazon wish list. That's the only. That's how it has to happen. If we don't do that, um, the uh, you know the whole gift giving ritual can't proceed smoothly, and uh, so. I just finished reading the book this morning. I, I, I had been taking it easy and reading little bits at a time and sort of relaxing into the pace of the, the narrative, uh, which, as you noted, Doug, is uh, slower and, and meandering. I would say thoughtful. I think that he's a, this Reverend John Ames is a, he's a thoughtful uh, kind of preacher. Uh, I, I think he's a, uh, well, I don't want to get into his character so much. More like, why are we reading this? Like, how did this c come about? And like, what is the, what might be the significance of, of a book like this? Um, I don't, I was trying to remember how it came to my attention. And I can't remember exactly. I'm pretty sure that I picked it up, the book, downtown, either at the library or in my neighborhood because we have a number of these little uh, free libraries. They're like cute little houses with little doors and windows and people put books out that you can you know, take for free and leave. And I might have found it in one of the free libraries or in the public library. Uh, but I think the reason that I was attracted to it or the reason that it came into my awareness is because on our forum, on Infinite Conversations, there's been... Um, uh, at least a couple of people have brought up Christianity as a topic of discussion. And, um, you know, I think the, the, pro the proposal or what, what they seem to be, you know, saying, and I'm thinking specifically of uh, Fred and Katina, and you could go on the forum and anybody who's watching this, you could find, find their posts or we could link to them. But, you know, I th there's, there's like in our, discourse, more broadly speaking, social political moment, right, in the United States and in, it, different in diff, it's different in different countries. Ed could probably speak to, to the European context better. But certainly in the United States, there's a, there's a huge divide between rural, traditional Christian America and modern, progressive, liberal America. And it's a geographical divide. You have the more progressive, modern, kind of on the coasts and in these pockets, you know, these like bastions of, of liberalism uh, in the, cent the middle part of the country. I'm thinking of places like Madison, Wisconsin and Austin, Texas and the Boulder, Colorado area. Colorado is sort of a special case, but there is this divide uh, in our way of seeing the world, in, in our way of communicating our values uh, and... Um, just the, I think, the horizons of life, the life world, the life worlds that, that we live in. And I think, and this is my, the first book by Marilyn Robinson that I've, I've read. I had really not, she had really not, uh, I may have recognized her name as an author, but I really didn't know anything about her. 
Uh, and so I listened to a couple of interviews and I listened to her reading that you posted, Mark. And it seems like she's somebody who, um, as an artist, as her intellectual and her artistic part of her and, and her spiritual, I think, purpose uh, is to maybe bring the perspective of that traditional Christian rural America to a, um, a broader audience, to an Amer a, a more broadly American audience. Uh, she's been very successful. Uh, she got won the Pulitzer Prize for this book, uh, National Book Critics Circle Award. She was interviewed by Barack Obama uh, for you know one of the I don't know which magazine, the New York Book you know, Review of Books or whatever. So she's very successful, and I think she is representing this. I hesitate to call it a tradition, but some stream in American thought that um, uh, is integrated in some way of the the values and ideals of you know the republic, what America you know aspired to be, uh, and uh, the the more rural, traditional, and grounded you know ways of being that this preacher, I think, um, is representing and, you know, standing for, you know, holding a place for. So this book takes place, these letters from John Ames, Reverend John Ames to his son. It's in like 1956. It's a small town called Gilead, fictional town in Iowa, based on uh, the author Marilyn Robinson's hometown, which was also in Iowa. Uh, and the town is unremarkable in all the ways that John Eames uh, finds ex exceptional beauty in, actually. Uh, but to just the ordinary eye, it would appear to be a um, just a, a small town with not much to it. Uh, a shabby church, a, a, you know, maybe a few different you know, denominations, Presbyterians, Methodists, Congregationalists, Baptists. Um, but it had a history that was significant in terms of in terms of American history uh, relating to the Civil War and slavery. Uh, it was one of the, I guess, these middle zones in middle America where uh, abolitionists were clashing with um, what, who were, you know, people who would become Confederates you know, in the Civil War. And John Ames's grandfather was a fanatic abolitionist uh, who, you know, he describes him very vividly as having lost one eye because he, you know, took up arms uh, for the cause of, of freeing the slaves. Uh, and he incited his own congregation to, to war. And this became a great point of division between himself and his son, that is to say, the, the narrator's father, also named John Ames, because the, the son of the grandfather, <laughs> that's getting confusing, but uh, he became a pacifist. So he, he went and joined the Quakers. And although they remained deferential and respectful to, to each other in the way that reverends would do, addressing each other as reverends and so forth, there was a deep, uh, deep divide between them. And in some way, I think that this, this, this narrator, John Ames, who's reflecting back on his family's history, on the uh, political history, uh, on the theology, really, of the righteousness uh, of the, the cause, you know, that his grandfather was representing versus the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the grave, I think, problem in pursuing violent means, you know, even for a, uh, a justified end. Um, he's bringing some kind of, he's some kind of, I think, in my view, a balanced perspective to it, some way of, of bringing those together. Uh, and I think that's what the author uh, and probably why Obama was attracted to, to her work as well and, and listed as one of his fav you know, favorite books. Uh, you know, it is, I think the author is trying to bring this, uh, certainly this uh, a Christian perspective, certainly a, a religious perspective, 
but also an integrative perspective from the from an, an American tradition. Like it, she's she's trying to bring that into greater, I think, awareness or great into into the into the culture. Uh, and it's it's a uh, probably a losing battle, <laughs> I think, and it's probably a um, futile uh, in, in some ways. But what I think she's giving us in this novel is an attempt to to express the truth as she sees it, uh, and to you know, through this through the lens of a of uh, a person who a preacher who um, you know, to the popular imagination is is actually a very stereotyped figure. And she's giving us his inner life. And he's a man who's coming to the end of, of his life. He's reflecting back on his family. But, but a, a very interesting thing happens, which is that, that we have this prodigal son kind of uh, um, archetype play out where I, I, I'll, I'll just kind of give this and I'll, I'll, I'll let others start to fill things, other things in. But uh, he has a, a good friend in the town. Uh, who is, um, uh, what's Botton's first name? It, it, Does he have one? I don't <laughs> no, know. He, <laughs> he, he has one. If you only ever calls him Botton. You know? <laughs> so he, he's, a, he's a fellow preacher. Uh, he's a Presbyterian yeah, he's a minister. Presbyterian. And they're, they're childhood friends. They grew up together. They, they, he was, he uh, was called Bobby. Bobby? There's a reference at the very beginning somewhere. Robert. Maybe it was Robert. He was called Bobby when he was a child before okay. he was called Barton, so. Okay, well maybe it was Robert, but um, anyhow, they're lifelong friends. They've grown from childhood to adulthood. They're both ministers and, and they've, they've shared the, you know, this vocation together. Uh, but John Ames, he lost his wife and child uh, soon you know, after he got married. Uh, his wife's name was Louisa, I believe, and his child, Rebecca. And so he went through many years, decades of being alone. Whereas in contrast, his friend, Boughton, Bobby, uh, had many children uh, and prospered in that sense. Uh, how, except for there was one child that he had uh, whose name was Jack, but who, or rather who, you know, who he named after his friend, John Ames. So he named, Jack was his nickname, but he named him John Ames Bottom. So there's a son who um, turns out to be a kind of prodig prodigal son. Like he is a rascal. He's always causing trouble. Uh, he, he steals. He, you know, lights mailboxes on fire. Uh, and, and he gets into some trouble when he's a, an adolescent in college. He gets a, a young very young uh, girl pregnant uh, and uh, she's a very poor person from a poor family. And then he, for various kind of complex social reasons, like he abandons them, that his child, but his family, Boughton and uh, John Ames, they try to take care of it. But ultimately the child gets in, an injury, gets sick and dies. And uh, Jack Boughton, uh, leaves and goes off to, to, to live a life that, uh, you know, nobody knows much about, but he becomes estranged. He becomes, you know, from, from his family, but he was also that like the apple of his father's eye. So we're kind of replaying a, a biblical story. Uh, and he comes back and begins um, spending time with Ames's son and with his wife. And the old preacher who, you know, was really, I think, in the mode of reminiscing, of trying to tell his story to his son and prepare for his own death, he becomes very perturbed by this because he's threatened. He feels threatened by Jack. Uh, he sees that, uh, you know, one important detail is that his wife is a lot younger than, than he is. Uh, he met her decades later, and he, he has a very interesting description of her. She seems, in fact, Robinson dedicated a novel to her. This is the first book in a trilogy. Uh, so there's a book called Leela, uh, I believe, which is all about her. But she's younger, and and he begins to worry that, um, you know, maybe John Jack 
uh, could become a, a bad influence. He, he deeply distrusts him. He, he doesn't uh, uh, trust his character, but he has to in some way love him and has to in some way forgive him because that's what he has to do as a Christian. And he's struggling with this. Uh, he feels foolish. He feels ashamed even to be having these kinds of feelings, having this kind of reaction. Uh, and he's do documenting it for his son. So there's a, a profound a confessional quality uh, to this, where he, in a way, he wants to demonstrate to his son how he's dealing with this situation. I won't go further than that, other to say that, that you know, part of what surprised me in the reading is how a very meditative kind of narrative uh, which, you know, had these historical and theological uh, dimensions to it, how it suddenly became very personal and, um, and disturbed. Uh, and, and then finally, in the, in the denouement of the book, we learn uh, the details of Jack's current life. And uh, it's, it's a surprise, to me, it was a surprising tur turn, but, a, but very interesting, because it ties back then to the historical narrative with the grandfather and slavery and you know, the history of race in America. Um, so there are many things in play here uh, in this in this novel. Uh, I don't really want to, I don't feel even feel appropriate speaking as a critic or a reviewer, but to me, just from that perspective, it felt like a very successful novel. Uh, I think it touched on issues that are, you know, red hot today, even if they are smoldering under the surface. And, and, um, and it, the prose is so well crafted, and the thought so um, uh, so uh, just thoughtful, uh, unpretentious, clear, lucid, uh, but honest. Like there's a truthfulness or a feeling of truthfulness, I think, in the text that you know, like we is very refreshing, and it's it's very different than the the mood, the dominant mood of sort of postmodern culture. And uh, to me, in that way, it's kind of an antidote to that. And so when, you know, in response to Katina and Fred bringing in the, you know, bringing up the question of Christianity and like the way in which it, in this kind of inversion, it becomes um, uh, like, uh, well, Let's talk about that. I mean, let's come back to that. But it, it, it becomes almost a persecuted perspective uh, in, in the modern world. So they've wanted to, I think, you know, offer some kind of apologetics for it. And I, I think that this book, being a novel, not being, including theology, but not being theological or not being philosophical uh, only, uh, I felt like it would be a good prism for examining like those questions and issues and um, and and also for the opportunity to just spend the time in the mind of, of somebody who is taking life and looking at life in a very different way and you know really has not ventured beyond this this small village except in his mind because he's a very deep thinker and a, and a deep reader and uh, that that uh, studiousness um, really, you know, comes through in his, in his voice and his, his, uh, his views of things. So um, I'm curious what everybody else thinks. I really enjoyed the book and I'm glad that this is, I'm glad we're have, having the opportunity here at the end of the year, especially, um, to reflect on it. Can I uh, pick up on, on, on what you were just saying? The I got to the book because you said you wanted to discuss it on the 18th of December. That was the first time I had heard of it. That's the first time I ever seen the name. That's the first time I even knew that this person existed. And I go, okay, if you guys want to talk about it, I'll read it. Um, and and I was I'm, I'm absolutely delighted that I that I was made to stumble across it, so to speak. You know, I was. I don't generally think about these kinds of things. Um, you know, like how do I come to read a book? I see it's like you, I was in the store. I picked it up. I look at it. It seemed interesting. I took it home and three years later. I pull it off the shelf because I'm bored. And I, it's, you know, one of the mo most marvelous experiences that you have. When we talked earlier 
in one of our cafes about our five favorite books. And I had mentioned The Sorrows of Young Werther. That, that was one of those books laid up here on my bookshelf for years. And then I go, well, I, well, I guess I'll have to read it. And what I found, there was, um, and, and, and the, I think it's, it's very appropriate in this, that was also just a series of letters. Here he's writing one to his son. And, and The Sorrows of Young Werther is in the, a series of letters that the friend writes to the narrator, who then ends up killing himself over this unrequited love that he can have. And so it was also a novel without a plot. And, and I'm, I'm absolutely fascinated by novels that don't have plots because they can work. And Goethe's worked well, and this one works beautifully. There is a little bit of a kind of a storyline, but you get it towards the end and you impose it back on everything else that you've done. Because the idea of sharing with someone else how you see life when you're older um, is not a, that uncommon. You know, Doug, who isn't all that old, said, you know, well, I thought about writing a you know, letter to my own son before he even stumbled across it. I've been working on one for my grandkids for three years. It was just like, it, it just seems like the right thing to do. And I was really pleased to see, well, it's not that odd. I'm not, you know, I didn't think this was all that. At the time, you know, why am I writing to people that are probably you know, never going to read this? But um, the idea is you approach, I approach the things that I say when I write in that, much like Ames approaches what he does. I, I really love the way he goes about it. He, he has some thought and you can, and that's why meandering is okay in the one sense. Because he just kind of follows the flow of the stream where it's going to go. But all of a sudden, you go around a corner and he's right in the middle of a deep contemplation that, that literally, I, in many instances, just kind of like whoop, whips you around again and goes, but it's about this. And it's extremely focused. And it, it highlights, like you had said, Marco, things that we kind of have in the back of our mind, but don't bring up into the forefront of our mind often enough. Why are we, how do we do these things? Why, why is it so okay to live in Gilead and not go anywhere? Why, why am I not like my brother who went off to, uh, you know, to Germany and became the Herr doctor and, 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 and the self-proclaimed atheist who did his dissertation on Feuerbach, who was the most Christian atheist that ever existed. Which, which he also brings out in the book, when you realize, well, you really don't have to play by the, by the book to, to appreciate what the book's telling you, in that case, the Bible. And this is where, where and this is what I liked about Ames himself. He found a lot of his inspiration for things that came out of life. And the Bible was simply a vehicle to help explain those or to bring those across to other people who were looking to him because he's the preacher. I also found it very interesting that he never referred to his best friend by his first name. We have trouble remembering. Maybe it is Robert. You know. But, but it's, it's, if he had called him anything else, I don't think it would have been as personal. Because there was that we're kind of one, and, and, and his best friend names his oldest son after his best friend, you know, they're, they're, which is a very odd you know, you, you end up with a junior that's not your junior, but somehow you're involved. You know, there, there's this, this really intricate little knot that gets tied in the, in the middle of this. But I just, I, I found absolutely exquisite because it, it, it brings, it, it keeps everything together. There are really no loose ends when you're going through it, which is what I like the most about the book. What I also liked about it is it reminded me very, very much of my own youth. I'm about the same age as Ames's son that he's writing to. I'm the old man that his son was. And I'm reading the book. That was a good one. That was probably the best part. Because I can see myself in a lot of what that, what he's saying. I remember a lot of the things that he talked about, the Kiefhofer. I was only seven years old at the time, but you know, I remember my parents used to, they were kicking that stuff around. That was important to them. 
This was a big deal. He decided he's reading the paper. He's reading the newspaper to form his political opinion. You know, who does that anymore? <laughs> he's sitting on the porch reading in the paper, actually consciously forming a political opinion and who he might vote for. You know, those were those were heady days. My, I remember my father saying back then he couldn't vote for Adlai Stevenson because he was too intellectual. And in the end, he voted for Eisenhower because he was a general. You know, my dad never got out of World War II either. <laughs> okay, but it, it does bring my own youth into a clearer focus because it's very close to what I was doing. She, and she captured that exceedingly well. It was, there was an authenticity about how she described those times and places that reminded me of growing up in a small a small coal mining town, as opposed to out on the prairie somewhere. There was a few of those images that, that you know, don't really associate with deep-rooted, gnarly-footed, gnome-type people, um, like Western Pennsylvanians. <laughs> but um, that feeling about rootedness in where I am and where I come from, that, that, that comes across very strong. That's what the Germans call Heimat. That's also something that, that here is very strong. It's like you were saying, the, um, there might, there's a bigger difference between rural and urban America. But there's also a very big difference between rural and urban Germany, even though it's much smaller. And if you're, not, if, if you're a city person, you'll stick out in the country. And if you're a country person, you'll stick out in the city. It becomes immediately apparent you're not from here. You're, you just you see the world so differently, even though there's a lot of overlaps and a lot of sharing of that. So, so that that is kind of a universal thing. But where people are born here um, matters to them, regardless of where they go in the world. It matters to them. This this is where I come from. This this is, and it's it's the it's the it's the geography, it's the topography that you that you get connected to. That, that you can't let go. There are lots and lots of, one of the reasons I feel very comfortable where I am here, this looks like Western Pennsylvania. This looks like where I grew up, geographically, topologically. So I never felt estranged in any way. And then a lot of the things and the customs and the way things went here happened a lot more like it happened in small town, Western Pennsylvania, than let's say in a, in, a, in a bigger city or Pittsburgh or whatnot. So that, that also helps. And so I was able to adopt this and adapt to this surrounding that I feel very much at home here because I don't have that, that sense of high amount that I was doing. But I did want to at least highlight the fact that, the, uh, um, that Robinson really picked up on, on that, the vibe, the rhythm of that time, I, I remember that as well. Things did operate uh, at a different, uh, different pace. Um, he, he has a lot of re recollections about the, you know, his grandfather who lost an eye in the Civil War. Um, when my father died, my brothers cleaned out the house. We they found twelve letters that my great great grandfather had written to his wife while he was in the Civil War. He couldn't, he couldn't read and write himself, so he had to speak to somebody who wrote him. So all the letters were in different handwritings. Um, wow. And we just have the letters he wrote to her about his time. He died of dysentery two years after he got in. He never went back home. So, so that, that Civil War connection was there. Um, my grandparents were born the same time. He went out looking for his grandfather's grave with his father. Um, so all of those stories about their childhood, that all, it all rang true because of things that I had heard in my own family as, uh, as I was growing up. So I think that that's one of the things that endeared the book to me as well, because it was, I was able to establish this personal connection to it. But I think, I think even without that, like you're a lot younger than I am, and so is Doug, you still get a personal connection. And that's, that's what she does so, so well in the way she puts that book together is getting us into these this personal connection between things. So anyhow, that's my initial impression. Uh, 
uh, I got a little, can you clarify something? So the narrator, the writer is how old when he's writing this? It aims the character. Anyone? Uh, seventy-six. Seven. That's right. He's seventy-six. I think he has a birthday during the book. So. Yeah, I think he turned seventy-seven in the book. And his and, he, so, and his son, you said, was eight or seven. nine. Seven. Seven. So he had the he yes. had the son when yeah. he was in his seventy-one or something. Sixty-nine, seventy. Yeah. Oh, that's my age. Yeah. 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 Ah, it's still hope, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it, it, again. I didn't read the book, and I and and I have a, a obvious or usually as usual. I have a different take than all of you on it, just from hearing her read it and doing a little, you know, research on it and things like that. And and of course, I look at things stylistically and and uh things like that uh but i th the second passage she reads which is closer to the end of the book than the beginning of the book where she's talking about okay she robinson uh is writing from the perspective of a man who is 70 some years old and and lusting after this young female parishioner and so that's that's like a a, a fabrication there's no way she knows what that's like now i know what it's like sort of uh, so but obviously it rings true to all of you. Uh, but she has, no, she has no way of getting inside a preacher, 70-year-old preacher's head looking at a, I don't, a, however old that girl was, 20 or something, uh, who becomes the, the mother of the child. Then. And it's sort of, uh, so, so I, I, that bothers me. Uh, but it's, it, it brings to mind two other books. Uh, one I have right behind me, the other is in the garage. One was I, I, I won it in a contest reading my home in, uh, Oregon at this thing. Uh, and I, I, I was awarded second place and the book was called Nordy's Gift. Nordy is the guy's wife's name, and it's 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 a story about a, a rural Oregon, uh, and the guy <clears throat> Nordy is his wife, and he falls in love with a younger woman, and Nordy allows him the freedom to pursue his his lustful desire. For the uh, for the younger woman. Now I, I have to say I never read the whole book. The other book, the other book. Let's see if I can grab it here. Where is it? Here it is. Very very similar style. See how it's a it's over a thousand pages written. It's almost twelve hundred pages written by a female author in, uh, I think it's 19, I should find it here, 1965. It's called Miss Macintosh, My Darling. And it's, it, it's somewhat more authentic same style in that there, it's a reflection about a, a person's life. Uh, but it's, it's written by a woman, about a woman, about another woman. So it, I feel that it's more authentic 
because it's coming from a place that she knows she knows the inner workings of the the female you know it's probably a lot of her and it's also what i call the same stylistically i call it mfa writing which when i talked about way back when the, the perfect words the 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 different reasons uh, George Orwell say you write one of the four was aesthetically that's kind of what I call MFA writing you know beautiful prose it's very intentional and and this book Miss Macintosh by Darling it's just some some paragraphs are are half a page long and the writing is really uh, uh, you know what we'd call beautiful. Uh, I find it somewhat tedious and sort of, I had it by my bedside for a long time. If I needed to go to sleep, I'd start reading a little bit of it. Uh, so yeah, I have a, I have a different uh, take on it. Uh, some of what you said, I can very much see the positive, the positive aspects of it, like talking about growing up rural, the time, in other words, the setting, the setting and, and, uh, and the, uh, let's call them political issues about the, the, uh, the historical. So she's got the historical motive and, the, and, and the, uh, aesthetic, uh, motive. And and apparently uh, uh, political impulse also, so it's just uh, a a woman writing about the inner workings of a man. Of course, we men have been guilty of that uh, a lot. Uh, you know, it's just a it's it's a tough way to uh, for me for as a reader. I just question it. Okay, wh where'd you get your where'd you get your inner workings of a seventy year old preacher man from? You made it up, or you may have interviewed someone or known someone, but again, it's a it's a fabrication. It's not, you know, so. You know, but once it's on a printed page and people read it, then they tend to believe that it has an impact. Well, let's let's let me. I would like to just introduce a bookmark right there because I think you're bringing up an interesting question, which is that's my job. Sure, <laughs> um, but I'm not the que the question would be you know. To, you know to, how, what is the validity or the legitimacy of uh, an artist representing the point of view of another of a person whose identity that they don't share? I think that that's an interesting question. We could probably phrase it better than I just did, but that's more or less what you're getting at. How could uh, a, a woman write about a man? And you know, ha, ha, I think that it, you know, and the it could, that could go in any direction how could a, a man write about a woman how could a white person write about a black person how could one person from one culture or one sexual orientation or any number of other qualities write about any experience other than their own particular one and um i think that that would be an interesting question to explore but i'm not sure that um like i'm not sure it's like that is fair to the book uh because whether or not you know it's an accurate representation there's something being communicated there's some in the fictional world a character being conjured uh and whether or not it, it's real or accurate to is i think in a way secondary because when we when we step into the story when we step into the space of the story when we suspend our disbelief if you will uh if that's what we're doing then something is happening in that world that has to be, I think, met uh, on its own terms, you know, in, in a way, you know, not before, uh, but um, 
I think if, if we only have the meta conversation about whether or not, you know, uh, about the kind of identity, identity and representation, I think we may miss part of the deeper meaning or message that the, the author as an author, as an artist, however she is identified is tapping into and getting across. Like there is something more um, going on than here in, in however you might, we might fall like looking at the identity question. It, 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 there's something more going on internally in the story. And I wouldn't want that to get lost. That's all. Like, I think that the, the part of what she's doing as a writer, just as an artist, whatever you want to say about the validity of the perspectives is that she's establishing a tone. She's establishing a voice. She's uh, establishing character. She's establishing drama and conflict uh, between those characters. She's establishing an internal space of the narrator, you know, who, uh, real or not in actual terms, is, you know, we can re we can resonate with or we could uh, sympathize with, because even though they're not ourselves, this is a seventy-seven year old man. I've never been a seventy-seven year old man, but how is it that I can resonate with one? Something ha happens there in that um, literary space, but it's also the space of scripture. It's also the space of uh, myth, mythos, and so the 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 power, the value, the effect of of, of story is, I think, part of one the themes here. Like, and and so looking at what that actually means internally in the novel, uh, I think would be value. I think would be to me it would be more valuable than you know whether or not the the. the identity politics of it because uh th that would be an interesting philosophical conversation but there's something i think here that i want to bring out because i think it's getting at like what katina is talking about and what fred is talking about like what is and i'm not identified as a christian right so i'm really coming more from the modern perspective but what is the value of this christian ethos this christian worldview this christian um, and in, in the particular way that it's embodied in, in Ames. I, 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 I think that does more honor to the, to the, to the novel at this point. Just my, my pushback a little bit on, 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 uh, on your line of questioning. Could I step in? Um, um, hmm. uh. I think I'm going to come back to this point a little bit later after I go through the other issues that I wanted to bring up, which was, can you guys hear me? I, I don't have my earphones in. Um, so, um, so one of the interesting coincidences, so I'm like Ed, I came into this book because it was recommended for this site, never heard of it before, dug it up, looked up what Gilead means, so it was something about ill of testimony or something so it's it obviously relates to the focus of the book um the um i did see quickly that she's sort of considered to be a kind of standard representative of christian writing and so but that i sort of looked that up before i actually really started getting into the book and then I was surprised because there's nothing obviously directly Christian about the writing in the book. It just feels, you know, it does go into a little bit of discussion about Christian things, but it's about a preacher. So you would expect that from any writer. It doesn't feel particularly Christian as a book. Um, so I, I, anyway, so I, I was both surprised and, charmed i guess to some extent by the fact that it, there were, you know it's very subtle it's it's all about subtle feelings about these things rather than it, it's not process proselytizing in any way um but the the other thing is that i was reading i just picked up um 
some, a book I read years and years ago and hadn't read since, um, Fifth Business by Robertson Davies, which is, I don't know if you've read it, but uh, so Robertson Davies is a Canadian writer. It's about a small town, about a, a man who comes from a small town in Ontario. Um, but he becomes a teacher, but he's in, he becomes interested in saints. And so he does a lot of background research about saints. And he meets, for instance, a Jesuit priest uh, to talk about saints with the priest. And the priest says some things that dovetails kind of with this book. The priest says that he kind of wishes that Christ could come back as an old man because Christ's message tends to be a very young person's message and that uh, there's not a lot in Christian teaching directly about how to deal with the vicissitudes of being old. And, 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 you know, so this is kind of a, and, and somehow I got the two, I get the two books confused as I'm reading this one and I'm thinking about the other one because in some ways they echo each other about this. I mean, this is a lot, uh, a story about an old man, an older man and his thinking through things rather than a younger man, right? So, um, so I found that kind of interesting. Um, with regard to Mark, your comments about um, legitim legitimacy of the writing, I mean, I think every time, any time you you stick pen to paper or fingers to keyboard, and you venture into any character who's not yourself, you're making exactly the same kind of error. I mean, you cannot write in a legit, completely legitimate way about a character that's not you. You can, in a sense, only write about yourself. But of course, we write fiction. And so fiction means projecting yourself into some other character and, and taking the chances that come with it. And to some extent, I'm surprised that, that we succeed in writing any character in a successful way, because all characters are these projections and they are, and they're subsampled. They're like a, they're like you get a, you get little snippets of this fictional person's life. And then we fill in the gaps to make a full person out of it. Um, so that's for me kind of magical that we even, that it even works. It seems to me that if you, on a sort of, strictly intellectual basis, if you took up snippets from a person's life and put them down on a page, you shouldn't get this organic feeling person out of it. And yet you do. So uh, to me, the magic is there as opposed to this issue of legitimacy or whatever. I, I do think there is a question there that's interesting and, and worth exploring, as you say, Marco, perhaps another time. but. Uh, um, well, oh. I, I wouldn't mind going off of um, what you were talking about, Mark. I apologize for the multiple times I dinged in and dinged out there. I have a good connection, so I don't know what's going on, but hopefully you can hear me again. Um, before I read this book, I was introduced to her essays. She, or, um, she has at least four collections of essays which are maybe lectures or uh, perhaps even sermons that she's given to herself. And she is highly intellectual, highly thoughtful. Um, and I think I had read two or three of her essays. One's called Humanism. Another one was Cosmology. Um, but she does focus on Christian themes. And being not so Christian, I ten tended to go towards the essays that were less Christian focused and more, she, I, I think she, I, I don't know if she identifies herself as a Christian humanist, but she's kind of along the, those lines of, uh, well, anyways, her thought, as I mentioned, is very thoughtful. It, 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 and when reading Gilead there, I, as I was going along, I get the sense that a lot of the comments that, was, or, or, the depth of um, writing were, are, well, they're obviously her thoughts. And she, she kind of steps out of character. And it's almost like an inside joke to herself of, 
um, well, as a writer, she, she inserts, uh, he's, he's writing, well, I, I don't know about you. I'm overusing the word just. And, and when I use the word old here, um, I mean it, mean it in this sense, but I'm overusing it. And, um, so it's good for the character, but at the same time, it's, it's, you can read it as this is just her. Um, so there, there, I, I think at the beginning, at least from my perspective, she, she is writing down her own thoughts. She hasn't maybe quite gotten into the character yet. She's kind of reaching out, sensing that just as um, John Ames elder is kind of sensing where he wants to go to in these letters. And I think Ed said it great, almost poetically where she, she, it's the stream of thought. And then all of a sudden there's kind of this rush of deep contemplation that kind of comes through and sucks you in just as perhaps if you're writing a letter, you, you remember this, Oh, this instant in the past and I need to describe it. Um, but she really just knowing, which I, I don't know Christianity. I don't know the, the themes and the topics she writes on to where I feel like I'm an ignoramus when I'm reading these essays that she's done. Um, but she does come out through the writing. So to, but she does jump into the character very well um, to the point where even though I was kind of searching for, well, maybe this is just um, a thought she's had and she's placed into an essay and she wanted to place it here or something like that, but she really gets into character and does a um, superb job of, well, per perhaps John Ames can be any man or any person. Um, these thoughts he's having can be or are thoughts that an intellectual who's read too many books um, would have. And so, so I think she does a great job with that. So I recommend reading the book and maybe we can have a discussion number two about that part. <laughs> Sorry, I missed, I, it was choppy there for about 15, 20 minutes. So I might've missed some of the other questions that were arising beyond that. Well, well I, I wouldn't mind just jumping back to Mark's point too um, about this writing other character uh, and come back to the Christianity because I think it's hard to understand the novel without some biblical background. I mean, the, there's, she's intentionally playing out themes uh, like the, Prodigal Son, uh, especially, uh, and uh, you know, more than I, I, I also feel like an, even though I went to Sunday school, I feel like an ignoramus with respect to, to a lot of this thing too. But now I just want to say, in defense of the auth of an author, or any author, that a part of the art is the creation of character. It is the creation of the interiority of human beings, uh, and arguably an author could do that better than a first person could themselves. Like certainly I can express myself, like there's no not being me, but in the way that I use language, I, I could be more or less effective at expressing the particularity of being me. And an author to their, their power of observation and their practice of observation, I think learns how to express a person better than even the person might be able to express themselves. So I have to assume that because this feels so, I, I've, so, I had in the midst of reading this wondered, this feels like so real. This feels like a real, I was forgetting that it was, and this is the, of course, a successful effect, right? Of the, the writing process, the writing, but I was forgetting that it was Marilyn Robinson who was creating this, this preacher. I was really feeling like that it was a real person. And so, of course, now reflecting on that, I, I see how the, the, you know, that that's uh, in a way of a, fab, a fabrication, uh, like, like you're saying. And Doug is pointing out the fact that, you know, she, that Marilyn is also an essayist who has particular ideas that she wishes to get across. Uh, in fact, she went, I think, two decades without writing a novel. She had written a book called Housekeeping that was very well received. Uh, and then spent two decades writing essays before 
having the idea for this novel and then coming back to write it. But I think it would be fair to uh, assume that many of the themes and particular ideas that she's been addressing in her in her essays, this apologetics uh, for a, a kind of you know Christianity and a reinterpretation of Calvin. This is one of her themes. Uh, you know, she's arguing against, I think, the idea that uh, that Cal- Puritans, Calvinists, Christians in general are anti-body or anti-sex. Or she's she's trying to, in a way, reinterpret uh, or recast, you know, how Christians are seen. Uh, and in a way, you could see this book as a means of really fleshing that out. Like in in the in a character in a life world, uh, and so you know, in I, I feel like that that I, I'm an outsider to that world, but through the process of reading, and to the extent I can connect that with times I've been in towns like this, or with my wife's family, who's who are Lutherans in Minnesota, a similar kind of uh, world uh, and worldviews. Uh, I feel like I get I can get inside them, and it's through the author who has this world inside her, but also is an observer, uh, and is able to represent and communicate that that world to people like you know me. So that's uh, I'll say about that. I, I I'd like to reinforce that, Marco. Um, I I felt closer to to the story itself because the kid was my age or about my age or Mark and my age. But there were a lot of things in the way, and also the way Ames talked about it, that reminded me a lot of my great grandfather I spent a lot of time with. So I, I, I kind of picked up like phrases, uh, ways of saying things, uh, ways of bringing them across that, that rang very true to me because I'd heard them before in my life. And, and, I never, maybe I'm weird in that regard, but when I'm reading a book, I never think about who's writing it. If you had asked me in the middle of reading this, you know, my fellow I said, what are you reading? I said, oh, I'm reading Gilead. And she'd go, who wrote it? I would have gone, I'd have to look at the cover. And then I go, oh, is this Marilyn Robinson or whatever? And I don't think I would have thought twice about it because I don't care. I, I don't care if it's a woman. I don't care if it's a man. I don't care what they're writing, about how real, and this is, the magic that Jeffrey mentioned, how, how magical is it? You know, if you're making the magic happen, I don't care. And and that was the thing I liked about this is Ames is an, an exceedingly consistent character. He's, you see him go through this. You, you kind of move along with him. And, and he doesn't have, he doesn't have that, as Jeffrey pointed out, if you don't quite get it right, they come across artificial or wooden or flat, or we have lots of ways to describe characters that don't work, but he, he works, you know, he, he just, he's, he's authentic. You know, Ames is an authentic person. This is a person that's, you know, expressing his view on how he see things. And she captured that very well. And I think that's, that's actually, I, I find that very enviable to be able to pick up, you know, she would have talked to her grandfather. She would have talked to other older men who would have said things that Ames could have said. And and she probably did remember and, and put them down. So, you know, it doesn't have to be, I don't think it has to be, I don't think a lot of writing is a real conscious fact. There's Sure, there's certain things that can be very artistic and aesthetic. And I agree with Mark on that point. You can also take it to an extreme. And it's great if you're if, if you're suffering from insomnia. Because you read a couple of paragraphs and you're gone. But other ones won't let you sleep. You know, this is this book I never read. But I tried it once before I went to bed. It was the worst thing I ever did. It was the worst night's sleep I had in two weeks. Because I couldn't stop thinking about what it is that she's bringing up. Because she is touching on a lot of things. And again, this is a personal part of that. I grew up in an extremely fundamentalist household. So she's, you know... I, I went to Sunday school because I had to, <laughs> and I was always there, <laughs> and you always had to uh, know what was going on. And my mother did ask me what did they talk about, and she knew what they had talked about beforehand. 
you know, to make sure that I was getting the message that I never got, you know, in the end. But because I don't identify as a Christian, but I have an extremely Christian background and a large Christian involvement. And, th and this book, that, that's a part that fascinates me as well. Um, I have a very ambivalent um, relationship to Mr. Calvin. And she made the man almost sympathetic. I, I actually thought more than once re reading this book, I think I have to look <laughs> at John Calvin again. There are a couple of things I know I'm never going to get past with him. One of them that comes up in the book was predestination. And, and, and Ames tactfully avoids getting into it. Because I, I don't think it's something that fits well and sits well with how he sees the world and understands the Christianity that he, that he lives. It, it's a sticking point. But... He knows it's there. He acknowledges that it's there. He gets into those same kind of discussions with, uh, with his namesake, who, who he actually, that, I was also t very much taken by, I'm, going, I'm reading this, I'm going, how's he going to get out of this? This isn't going to go the way I think it's going. Of course, she was leading me down the garden path, okay? Also good on her part <laughs> on how that turned out. Um, but, it, but it comes up in a, in a number of places where, where he, he, we always talk about it being Christian, but you wouldn't know that it's Christian if somebody didn't tell you that it was Christian. Because it's, it's simply human, it's, it's, it's humanness in its, in its truest essence. It's what makes us human. And that's what makes the difference. And she can address that point. Sometimes it has a very Christian shading to it. And sometimes it has a more secular shading to it in what she's doing as well. It just because it just comes out of life itself. And, and the doctrinal things, I found that very interesting because they come up a couple of times in the book as well. He always mentions the point and then skirts around it. He never really delves into them because they're things that people have to figure out for themselves. The, the discussion groups where she comes to the Bible group after, you know, when, when they went after she tells them, you know, well, you got to marry me kind of thing. She shows up for that, that session. And, and the women are ready to pounce on her and go, well, this is the way you have to believe. And they go, well, actually, no. His, his tirade, very many, against the radio preachers who undo, that came up in the, one of the readings that she did on the tape, that undo 40 years of work. I'm, I'm finally getting these people to start actually feeling and thinking about their own faith and then some jerk comes along and screws it all up because he's got some pat answer that doesn't fit anywhere. You know, I, I could relate very well to that because I used to, that's what my mother had on in the background in our house. That was always playing. So I'm going, well, okay, yeah, that's why I reacted very negatively that she actually pointed that, put that in the sympathetic light because he exhibited that Christian virtue we call it Christian. I think it's a human virtue of just taking people for what they are, just accepting their humanness, no more, no less. That was one of the you know the things that I that, that impressed me about that. But just to reinforce what you were saying. Well, just briefly, and then I'll let you guys continue. Is that that was her intention? From what I picked up on reading about her and and what she said. Was she wanted to to soften the image of John Calvin, and obviously she did so, at least for you, Ed. And and it, in other words, she did have an agenda, and she hit those she hit those marks, uh, which you know credit. Uh, and and uh, so I have no I have no problem with any of that. Uh, I'm thinking, oh, sorry, Mark. Uh, I'm thinking, um, um, Mark, that uh, maybe you have, um, so um, if the writing um, doesn't gel with one's experience of the world, 
that's when you start to question the writer's effectiveness to produce these characters, right? So there's not there's nothing that I've seen so far in this book that doesn't ring true uh, along the lines of what Edzo has been talking about to real situations involving these kinds of people in life as I've encountered them. Not that I encounter it very often, but I have on occasion. And it rings true with that. Um, there was another book that I read by a, a, a very well-respected writer. Um, it's a book called The Sea by John Banville. It's considered one of the best books around. Anyway, I, I read it and I hated it. And the reason is the book describes a person going through a grief experience on the death of their wife, a man going through a grief experience on the death of their wife. And it was so counter to my own experience of grief. It, it, nothing about the experience jived with my own experience of dealing with that kind of situation. And so I, I, I found the book almost in, unsupportable. To, to to read this and and I looked up the, the the author and you know he hadn't lost anybody and so he was projecting his own understanding of the grief process onto the characters now lots of people read that book and they love it so it, it works you know for but but for me it didn't work at all so it's it's this question of whether or not the character meets your expectations of what happens in real life and perhaps you have a different experience with this mark i'm just wondering if maybe your sense of distrust because i hear kind of distrust about the character and the way well you didn't, i guess you didn't read the book so <laughs> <laughs> that, I, I just listened to it yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah yeah i just I, <laughs> certainly the case i just listened to it but uh, that's that's sort of my point is that it's, it, it, but this goes to life and goes to Marco's question about reality. We've all been talking, you know, what is reality and what's real and what isn't. And, and uh, authors, when you read something or you see it in a movie or it, it sinks into your consciousness and it in, influences you. And, and so in the case of what you're talking about, Jeffrey, where, where somebody describing a grief experience, but you've got all these people and all these telling you how you're supposed to feel or how you're supposed to think when as a person, as an individual, for, for me, one of my, my big things is that's very personal and and I take a that's one of the highest values I have is thinking independently figuring things out for yourself of course you have guides and teachers and Jeffrey your paper was was excellent on on you know uh, uh, teaching uh, and there's all different methods and all different approaches and it, it's a it's a very uh, that's part of life and it's very difficult and it's very human I you know cats dogs whatever I don't think they give it a whole lot of thought <laughs> but we do we go backwards and forwards and and all over the place you know it's damn amazing that we had ever get anything done, which which speaks to again a long time ago. You know, with Katrina, the purpose of religion, its function is it provides order and comfort to people, but it could certainly it can be abused, uh, and and a lot of people you know uh, escape from freedom. Freedom is a terrible thing. Uh, you know, a lot of people just, you know, they, they'd, ra they'd rather have somebody or something that they believe in. Uh, uh, you know, evidence be damned. 
just you know give me some give me some comfort and, and order to life and and i I, in the book I just am releasing, I go into all of this, but in a, what I think is a realistic way, talking about the divide in the country and, and the, the urban versus the, the rural people and, and how, oh, it was just, it's turned into something vicious. And, I, and I'm looking forward to, to trying to bridge that, divide a little bit so as an a as a as a full-blooded atheist i you know I, but I, I i think i understand and therefore i have compassion for all these people that that have been mocked and and uh in the country uh so anyway hmm. Um, I think hmm, uh, many interesting ways to go with this. Uh, well, I'm, what, I'm, what's coming to mind, something I want to present, presence in this conversation. You know, we have 35 minutes left and uh, there's a core to this book, I, I feel, that um, has to do with the question of religion and faith and what that means. Because one of the arguments, and it's, it's not even quite an argument, I had the passage open and I, and I lost it while looking for something else. But one of the arguments that, so I may or may not be able to find it right now, but one of the, but that, that Ames makes is that if you really, and this is how I would phrase it, if you really understood faith, you wouldn't be able to argue for or against it. Uh, and what faith ultimately is, is a mystery. There's a something. <laughs> it's it's uh, uh, notoriously difficult to define or talk about. But he, he tries, I think, to do it in these slant ways. He doesn't want to get into theological debates. And he's like, he's tired of them. When they come up, he expresses how tiresome they are to him and how little interest he has in defending his faith and debating it. Uh, it's irrelevant, I think, from his point of view. But num numerous times in the novel, he will describe a scene, he'll make an observation, he'll paint a picture that I think is, although he doesn't say it explicitly, is his way of conveying the faith experience, what it means to be in a relationship with God. Uh, this is probably not even the best one here, but I, I'd like to just share a, a passage from the text. This is from page 74 in the first edition, paperback. Uh, he writes, I walked up to the church in the dark, as I said, it was a very bright moon. It's strange how you never quite get used to the world at night. I have seen moonlight strong enough to cast shadows any number of times. And the wind is the same wind, rustling the same leaves, night or day. When I was a young boy, I used to get up before every dawn of the world to fetch water and firewood. It was a very different life then. I remember walking out into the dark and feeling as if the dark were a great cool sea and the houses and the sheds and the woods were all adrift in it, just about to ease off their moorings. I always felt like an intruder then, and I still do, as if the darkness had a claim on everything, one that I violated just by stepping out, the do out my door. This morning, the world by moonlight seemed to be an immemorial acquaintance I had always meant to befriend. If there was ever a chance, it has passed. Strange to say, I feel a little w that way about myself. He goes on, there's a little bit more to that particular passage, but there, 
like I said, numerous instances where he's observing something like that, something like a natural scene or his son playing uh, the, his wife's face. He, he, he really has a lot to say about it, a lot to say about the way that her gaze affects him, how it makes him feel exposed. It makes him feel inadequate to, to some inner knowledge, some kind of wisdom that she, that she seems to have. Uh, and, and I feel that this is where he really is and the author really is conveying this sense of the mystery that all, you know, what Feuerbach and Karl Barth and the theological, like those are, are very important, I think, at, at, at certain levels. But then there's something beyond that. And, and this is part of, I think, also what Marilyn Robinson's trying to say about the divine, which our Bindo was also saying, and, and I think is a, um, that there's something so radically beyond our ideas about things. Uh, and then, but that, but that, that radical beyond this shines through in these moments of perception, illumination, even vision. There's a very interesting discussion in this book about vision, the distinction between the kind of vision that his grandfather had, who literally saw, you know, the Lord or other beings and had conversations with them uh, and was really very driven uh, by these visions and the kind of visions that John Ames, the, the narrator, describes, which are much more ordinary. They're not otherworldly. They're not alien. They're uh, the sun and the moon. They're the face of a child. They're uh, the moonlight. They're they're the you know the 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 way that um, and in his role as a as a minister, that blessing is like. What does that mean to bless? another being to wish them, wish something for them. Uh, the experience of faith and the experience of that mystery in, in those moments, I think is what the, this novel really is about. Uh, and uh, so I'm, I'd be very curious, you know, in, to, to explore that side a bit, a, bit, a bit more, because to me, this is also what is sort of lacking in the modern experience and in the modern world and in our contemporary discourse is that there, there really isn't a, a sensitivity to an attunement with that, that uh, mystery, you know, that sort of beyond our whole human realm of ideas and debates and, and issues. And, and I, I wonder if that's part of what Robinson is really, what her gift really is or what her art really is offering. I think what you're describing, um, Marco, is a sense of awe. That that's what I miss in in a lot of modern things. That's what I miss in a, even even in theologians. Sometimes you, you just read it and you're going, "Okay, well that's cold as ice." What what does that have to do with anything? Um, one of the books that popped up here and uh, our discussion was. Uh, it's actually the one on, on religion and Christianity. Somebody said, well, well let's read the, uh, the Idea of the Holy by Otto Rank. And so I happen to have it on my shelf. I pulled it off and started leaping through it. It's in German. I'm reading it. You know, I'm looking at it in German. And that's all it's about. That, that's where he starts. He starts with this sense of awe. And he, he tries to explore the sense of awe. And, and I know that all of us that are here have felt it. I, I've, I've heard Mark talk about it that when he's been, he's been out in the woods and he's been out just like he goes out into the darkness. He's just going up to the church. But that, that moment when you realize the moon can cast the shadow, it's one of those moments that it catches you off guard. It, it captures your attention. It makes you think. And a lot of people forget about it and move on. And a lot of people carry it with them for a long time because it's not, it's not, I'll go back to your fabrication, Mark. It's not real light. It's just reflected light. It's not like the light of the sun. It's direct and there and warm or whatever, but it still does something like that. And so it, 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 it captures you. And this, and this sense of awe, I find terribly missing in, in modern life. 
You know, there are there, there is a mysterium tremendum. You know that that and that that feeling of where the hell am I and where do I fit into all of this kind of thing? And and that's that's missing too often. And I think that's one of the things I, I'm I'm going to give uh, Ms. Robinson credit for. She's able to capture in in passages like that you just wrote, where we realize that's what's moving and driving um, uh, John Ames. Uh, oddly enough, in Hebrew, the word for awe, having awe, is also the same word for having fear, to be a Afraid. So whenever you read it, that's why it's, it's really interesting to like read the Old Testament in Hebrew, because then you realize, well, I can read this and they were afraid. And you can read it and they were in awe. And it's a, it's a whole different, all of a sudden it's a whole different story. So I have these parallel stories that I can read through. And, and, and trying to, to harmonize, where do they agree and where do they, where's the dissonance between them? Is a, I, I find a very rewarding exercise. I'm not, I don't think I'm getting very far with it, but it's, it's something that it's very enjoyable to do, to realize that it's probably, and it's probably not either or, it's probably both. That, that's part of what I got out of our, our window reading. It's, it's, it is both. And to be able to experience both at the same time. That fear and awe, that, that's pretty heavy duty. And she, she, she captures that in, in a lot of those, those, those things that are, you know, those, like those passages that you read. I wonder if uh, part, of, part of the uh, divide today is that I don't know that who was talking about it? John was talking about going out in Manhattan and all the people. And, and, and I, I don't know that you get that sense of, of wonder and awe and awesomeness expansion when, when, you know, you, you, you the sky you see is a, a little thing and you can't see the stars or, or, you know, in the, in the sit. The lights, I mean, it's beautiful if you see the city lights, you know, you're up and that, that's, that's a, but when you're down in there, in the, in the, in amongst it, it's just, people don't look at each other in, in the eye. They, they, you know, they, yeah, they watch people, but, but they don't make eye contact. They, it's just, and, and so I think maybe Part of that is 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 that difference between the the planet Earth as this awesome, you know, third rock from the sun. Uh, I when I was in high school, Fort Collins, this uh, there were no zero black people, except associated with the college. But I think it was our uh, junior year. All of a sudden, this big, tall guy came out. He was black from Brooklyn. And he wasn't a novelty to me being in the, being in the Air Force. I, you know, hung out with black people a lot. So he and I, of course, became friends, associates, get high. He could buy liquor, wine. We'd pull up to the drive-in, and he's like, you know, set 16 or something and just and then we'd go out we'd smoke dope and drink wine and beer and and i took him up in the mountains once and this is a, this is a tough guy from you know and he was six foot six foot five six foot six or something i took him up in the mountains one night and he was scared to death of the darkness just he couldn't get out of there fast enough I mean, he would, he, he just turned to, you know, the frightened little kid who was, you know, crazy. The dark's full of awe and fear. That, 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 that's a perfect example. Exactly what I was talking about, Mark. I, I, cause you can see it the other, you can take a, a country bumpkin. So, you know, to over the hyperbole and put them in the city and, and they'll freeze because, there is too much of whatever. 
but, 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 Crocodile Dundee. <laughs> I was going to say, they, all, they made a movie about it the other way around and how he managed to get through it, which is all very well and good. And it's a nice uh, story and it's very entertaining. But the reality is that they are very different worlds, but there are commonalities. People react in certain ways. We, if we understood that, we'd probably all get along a little better with one another, those kinds of things. You know, so there, there, you know, there's that, that general point to do. Um, to be made as well, but uh, I don't know where I was going with that. So, but, but while I, der- I derailed my own train of thought again, so I'm good. good. But while a starry sky will get you to that sense of awe, sometimes when you're in that sense of awe, everything becomes so. You look out the window in an urban environment, and it's all precious. It's all important. So it's not just about what you're looking at. It's about what state of mind are you in when you're doing the looking, right? So, Like uh, Allen Ginsberg, the poet Allen Ginsberg, his his famous poem Howl is a great example because it's all, you know, urban. It's all the, you know, wreckage of the modern world. Um, He has visions of, uh, you know, machinery, Moloch, Moloch, you know, coming out of the sky, the, the grand, uh, uh, you know, the the, um, the beast of of modern civilization, but he's seeing it as as holy. He's seeing it as expressions and manifestations of an infinite or divine, and that's part of what's so you know radical about about his poem. Totally different, totally different kind of writing uh, and uh, kind of even theology uh, and spirituality than 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 this one and. Um, I mean, that again is the difference maybe between that visionary in the sense of seeing literal, you know, visions or things that are not of the material world and the kind of, um, more everyday or ordinary visions that John, uh, Ames has, uh, in, in this book, because, you know, God, the, the, you know, the, the infinite that is, can't be limited to a rural environment over and over, you know, and not an urban environment. I mean, if it, it is truly, um, you know, has the qualities that are ascribed, then uh, none of those should be limitations. Like, and, and really, it's a matter of grace in, in the language of Christianity as to perceiving it. It's always there, but you're not always you know, um, willing to see it. Uh, and I th- one of the things that was interesting about this, it's almost, it's so common. Like any, anybody who lives in a small town or anybody who lives in the Midwest in America wouldn't, I mean, it's like so in front of your face that you wouldn't find it remarkable at all. But to me, what was interesting is the role that the preacher plays in the human ecology. Like each town, each little town like Gilead in America, anyone taking a road trip, you know this. There's a few essential things that a town needs. It needs a shop, it needs a post office, and it needs a church. And so it's it's not a bar and a bar, <laughs> right? <laughs> Almost forgot. Um, and uh, you know, this is something his this is something in his family. His father was a preacher. His grandfather was a preacher. But they're woven into the tapestry, into the fabric of 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 these towns. And, you know, part of the reason, you know, part, part of one of the aspects of this story is the community. We don't talk so much about it, but there's the congregation, there's all the people that he's baptized, that he's buried, all the Sundays he talks about the sermons that he's done week after week after week. And he's playing a role in this community that has to do with I think in his in the way that he conceives and constructs his own role, but keeping some flame of that awareness of the mystery alive, like helping people get through the issues in their life, the things they've done wrong, the things they, the frustrations, all the things that he experiences himself. But in his role, he has to stand outside it and kind of help people through it, and and be a model, you know, f- for them as to really how to contextualize 
the trials and tribulations of life within this this in, this grand this grander mystery. Uh, and wh what I think is one of the remarkable qualities of Ames as a character is how conscientious he is with respect to that role. Uh, and in a way that that maybe his grandfather veered in, in, in one particular direction, his father in, in a different one, his brother in, in, in another one, he's, he stays faithful to, um, to, the, to the, the, the place of his, of his vision, the place of his connection. He, he stays faithful to it, and he doesn't get uh, dissuaded by rational argumentation. He's able to engage the theology. He's able to engage Feuerbach or... Um, he mentions Carl, Karl Barth as another, he's, he mentions a few, a few, a few books and theologians, the existentialists. I mean, he's re read, he's, he's read them, but, but they don't sway that the, me the mental argumentation doesn't sway him from the, the experiential, I think, validation that comes from this being present to what is present to you, to, to you. And, and, and relating to where that ultimately comes from. Uh, existence, he, he, bring, he brings up the point of existence. Like this, a, a, a couple points goes through some philosophical sort of uh, uh, um, dialogue about it with himself, but, but he, he comes back to it again as like, that's what it's about. That's why if you equate the, all, the, the divine with existence, then there's no arguing for or against it because you're presupposing being in um, in the, the very act. And if you were actually sensitive to that and to the miracle and the mystery of it, then you wouldn't be having this this debate. That that seems to be what he's what, what he's saying, and I mean that turns into a, a kind of theological argument like that 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 could be expressed in those terms, but um, but isn't most maybe, but, but doesn't, isn't most captured in those terms. Am I making sense here? I, 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 know, I know I had a point, but I. You did. I th you got it for me when you said John Ames, Ames. He, oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that that kind of like brought it together. And he, he's, he's very focused and he's, he's looking at it's It's something out there. Uh, call it a vision, whatever. It's something. It's not here, but he's he's aimed, and and he doesn't lose he doesn't lose sight of that in in what he's doing. He actually he aims, and you know it doesn't mean he hits the target, but he aims. He's he's really into that. And that I, I think that really describes him, and that was that came out of just how you phrased you know your sentence. He aims, aims. Hmm. And and the the discussion that's in the clip actually that uh, she presents of the cats and baptizing the cats is a perfect example of what you guys are talking about. This sense of the mystery in the heart of the daily, the the the, the bric a brac of everyday life. I mean, you know, you know, cats is part of modern life, and and the idea that you would baptize or ritualize something about that is. I don't know. It seems to me that that's, that's in a sense, it's interesting because when she presents that part of the reading, she laughs at her own, her own joke in a sense, right? When she presents it. So she's, I, I think this particular incident is central to the book. It's not just thrown in there as a, as a, um, as an anecdote. It's part of the story. I, I found it hard. I found it not hard, but uh, um, it, yeah, hard to imagine like a child these days doing something like that. Like just how earnest that these kids were. Uh, that's the kind of thing that maybe is also sincerity, you know, the sort of pre-irony. Like we're in a ironic and a post-ironic, I think. I think world, but there's it really. But, but it's funny Cared for the soul said, of the cat, right? I'm sure yeah, you're right for the modern generation. But um, 
my wife, as a young girl, dreamed of becoming a nun, you know, and it was one of her goals in life. Obviously, she didn't become a nun. And in Quebec, it could have been easily arranged, but, uh, <laughs> you know, it was part of the culture in those days. My, my let's see, grandniece, the niece who opened up the shop in Glenwood Springs, you just stay with me. They're all living uh, in my brother's place. He's lived there for forever. He's been married to his wife forever. They're Christians. So my grandniece, she's now 10. She is a chicken whisperer. Uh, it's crazy. They, they, they lived up in Alaska for a while. Uh, they came back here. She had the chickens flown from Alaska to Colorado. I don't know what's going to happen when they start dying because they don't live, you know. They're all named. That She knows their history. It's So that kind of connection to, to what I would call weird world, the world of, of you know, maybe this is the your cosmic time Marco, but it still exists. You know, I think if you, if you look, if people, there's a lot of interesting people and things and, and yeah, we need more, we need more compassion and understanding. There's documentary. Just interject one, one little thing since he mentioned chickens. My my grandson's best friend, they got a dog. It's a real nice, friendly dog and whatnot. And, and, and he was home the day after he first met him. And somebody who was over to visit said, oh, would you like to have a dog? And he, and he said, no. And, and they said, oh, well, well, what animal would you like to have? And he said, a chicken. Uh, there's a documentary called Chicken People. Uh, it's about um, competitive poultry, um, uh, pe pe people who raise poultry com competitively. Uh, some interesting characters there. I think you might, you might relate to your, was it your aunt? My grandniece. Yeah. Uh, people, she, people ask her when they're chick. A lot of people have chickens in rural places. Uh, my my hens aren't laying. What should I do? And she tells them how to, you know, get them to start laying again. I, <laughs> Does it work? I had, I had, oh yeah, I Maybe had chickens you know. once. I I yeah, had chickens yeah. once. Okay. Maybe you ought to have them again. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> I don't care for them because I, you know, killing them and plucking them and eating them and. Shoveling their shit. No, thank you. Did it. Don't want to do it again. All right, all right. Let's 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 come back to the to the text. Uh, so we have just a few minutes left, and we didn't. This book is divided into really just two parts, right? There's the first two hundred fifteen pages or so, and there's the very last section where we learn about Jack Bonton. And uh, since we're at the end, this might be a spoiler, but at this point, not anymore. Uh, we learned that you know, he has a wife and child himself, uh, and he has gotten he not not officially or formally married uh, because of miscegnation laws in in Saint in, in Saint Louis in Missouri where he lives. But he has an African American wife and, and child, and uh, He's been poor. He's been unable to provide for them. Uh, her, his wife's father is a preacher, and their family is re has rejected him. Uh, and you know, so he's come back to Gilead to see if this is a place where he could uh, bring his family and 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 live with them. He's he's not sure. It's not as friendly in you know in in St. Louis, but maybe this is a place. He, he ends up leaving uh, again and re relieving John Ames of the 
burden that he had been carrying, this, this concern that Jack would become a bad influence or would become some kind of um, usurper, usurper or, or, or um, um, uh, kind of imposer, you know, on, on his family. Uh, so you know, it's, there are kind of like these reflections that play back because, you know, it brings back the theme of his grandfather and uh, it brings back like this, um, this, uh, the, the theme of, um, of like the, like the, the value of family to, uh, to the man for a fulfilled life. This is very important to him that his wife and son are taken care of and that they're protected from, from harm. And it has been to him a great blessing after decades of being alone when his wife, original wife and child had died to, you know, to, to have his wife and, and son come into his life. Uh, and so there's something about this too that I think is, um, it's, it's, re- it's poignant and it's relevant to the times. Uh, and, and that's that this, it's going to be hard to say this, like without, um, and I'm already struggling with it, but uh, like what is it that makes a, a man, I'm going to just speak particularly about in gendered terms, just satisfied, you know, what fulfills their, their life. And, and, and I think that part of the point or argument that Robinson's making, which is exemplified and embodied in, in this character is that it's having a family, it's being able to pass something on, it's being able to um, leave, leave a, a life behind that, that continues after you. Uh, and the tragedy of Jack Bond, part of, part of the tragedy of, of, of his life is that he's not able to be with his family. He's, he's, you know, he's been this kind of devil, this uh, uh, difficult person uh, he's caused a lot of trouble. He's caused a lot of harm to others. And he's aware, he's aware of how damned he is and of almost how incapable he is of, of changing his own nature. Like that's where that debate question about predestination comes in. He kind of, uh, challenges, uh, the reverend with, with this theological question. Um, but the, his, his sadness, his loneliness is that he can't, you know, he can't share a life with his wife and with his wife and child, and this is something that, a- after a long, a, you know, a lonely life, uh, J- John Ames has has finally been able to have. And um, there's something about the way that those two different scenarios kind of juxtapose that I think is. Um, I don't know, I think I I I just think that it's one of the important points of uh, of this book and part of what even people like Jordan Peterson are, are saying like what is it that men need why are men so fucked up you know why why are they you know not taking responsibility not becoming you know growing up and um you know uh you know be, be, becoming um kind of integral uh integrated you know this is there's something about that here as well like that that i don't know I, i'm i guess i'm trying to say that i can resonate with that like i can i i think that you know there are many ways to live there are many different things that satisfy people but there's something in this you know something that is uh, that feels aggrieved that feels under attack in the traditional worldview that um has to do with what fatherhood is, what manhood is, like what uh, fulfillment is, uh, and you know the ability for this man to f- carry out his vocation, to play his role, to be useful. That's another theme that comes in utility. That's in the last lines of the book. You know he wa- he wants his son to be useful, uh, to be useful, and, and to and to be fu- fulfilled by relations. Like that that that's what it. Is requ- that's what it takes. You know, that's part of what it means to have a, a fulfilled human life for a man, anyway. Uh, and and 
and that is part of what is like under attack and aggrieved in you know the contemporary environment and if and for many good reasons too like not i'm not saying that there aren't really good reasons for uh you know for women and other people who identify differently to uh to press for their own cases and press for, press for different ways of of constructing value and meaning and fulfillment but uh certainly that's one of the fault lines in in our culture wars and i think it's part of what she's touching on in the novel as well Maybe that's too serious a topic, like for the end of the call. But I, I, I wanted to at least bring it up because I, I think it was an important piece, and it's I think part of also the story she's really telling by bringing this character Jack Boughton, his namesake, right into the into the you know into the narrative, uh, and like disturbing the, the the narrator so much by by his presence. No, that's, uh, I think you, I think you, I don't know if it was uh, triggered by the novel, but uh, I think what you said was you know, very true of today. And, and part of, part of the divide is, uh, yeah, life used to be, the roles were more defined but people still struggle. The, the, there's a universal, uh, it doesn't matter how far back you go, there are universa universalities to being a man that, that it's part of our nature and it's under, it's under pressure now. And what was the, when did she write this? What was the publication? It's like 2006, I think is when it came out. So that's a whole nother conversation. I, sure. I realize that, uh, you know, we've touched on it in various contexts. I, I'm trying to see multiple points of view. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make room for. That's why we love you, Marco. <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, there's all, there's always a, uh, you know, a reaction for or counter reaction for every what the what the hell is it for every a reaction for reaction, uh, and you know, you could see the back and forth of of um, grievance, accusation, revenge, defense, counter revenge, and these play themselves out in terms of how we judge and um, you know evaluate other you know people's ways of life like what makes other people happy what makes other people satisfied fulfilled um and part of what i think is maybe the way forward like is to have a more cosmopolitan a, 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 how to put this a kind of cosmopolitan and tradition traditionalism or traditional some way of being pluralistic and at the same time, including non-pluralism in your pluralism, if that makes sense. Um, I have to think on that one. <laughs> well, I mean, this is a this is like in will like not just Wilbur, but various other thinkers kind of divide up things very generally into traditional, modern, postmodern worldviews, right? And modern's kind of anti-traditional, and postmodern's kind of anti-modern and anti-traditional. Um, but because people really shake out across the spectrum, you know, some, the majority are more going to be traditional. Uh, and then you'll have people that are modern, people that are postmodern. But if you want to have a world where they all can coexist, you have to, you have to, you have to find ways to value what each of their respective psyches value and find a way where they can, um, you know, coexist. So I, I think that that's part of what has to happen intellectually, like that, that we have to kind of get out of the, I mean, and that's why even Christianity is useful because although in many expressions, it could be very judgmental. It also has a lot to say about the, the limits of judgment and Ames in this book is, you know, he's struggling with practicing that and how difficult that is to withhold your uh, 
your condemnation of somebody, no matter what, you know, for, for who they are, for what they've done. Uh, and, and so there's something almost that we, I think the modern, postmodern, and this might be part of what Katina and Fred were sort of saying, really can learn from and can, you know, bring into their own worldview from the Christian ethos. And, uh, and I think that has something to do with this, this, this way that you know, at, at its core, I think the Christian message, message is radically inclusive. And, you know, the idea that you could be a grievous sinner and still be accepted into the community, you know, still have a way of rehabilitating your, your soul like that. Um, maybe, maybe social justice movements can use some of that, you know, maybe they could be more forgiving, maybe they could be less judgmental. And at the same time, you know, have their, their cosmopolitan and their pluralistic um, aspirations uh, and desires. Uh, I, I feel like that there's something that these, dif- these polarized sides can learn from each other. Uh, but we have to do the, like we have to do the work of, of um, you know, sorting uh, of actually gr- coming to terms with the differences. Uh, and that, that's why I feel it's, it's valuable to read a book like this, even though it's so, you know, it's mainstream and it's, it's traditional in a lot of ways and it espouses good old fashioned values. But like in a time of, you know, relativism and time of disintegration, uh, you know, that could be, it could be very helpful to go to, to bring in what these values might, might mean and to reinterpret them in, in appropriate terms for, you know, for present, for the present moment. Anyway, that's all I think I want to say about this. I, I found it was a, a wonderful book. I'm glad that we've had a chance to speak about it. I'd love to hear any last thoughts you all have. And um, I have just this one, Marco, since you brought it up. I, I agree with you that we tend to intellectualize these things. And I think one of the things that Robinson's pointing towards is it's not an intellectual matter at all. It goes much deeper than that. It's an effective matter. It's how we feel. And I think even a level beyond that in some way, that it is ultimately what we have faith in, which I would just call the spiritual, whatever it is that we have faith in. And if you don't know what you have faith in, then you're probably lost and you're going to be judgmental and you're going to go, I think, because you have to know where you are coming from, where you're really, not where you think you're coming from, where you're coming from. And they can be radically different, but what we, and this is the thing that moved me the most about this book, is how human all of the characters were. They're, they're just human. Yeah. They have the real, the radically different, you know, John, John Ames and his namesake couldn't be more different. Boughton and, and Ames have their own contrasts, but they're somehow best buddies all of their lives, you know. There's no reason on God's green earth why, why Ames should have this young wife and a son that he, he thinks he has to write a letter to. You know, that, that, that's just they're, they're radical contrasts and differences. But what, what pulls them all together is their humanness. And if we could recognize the humanity in others, like we would like to have it recognized in ourselves, that's beyond just the intellectual. And, and that's what I think she's pointing at, and that's where... Christianity is as one example of any religious tradition, because if, if you look at them deep enough, they all start looking the same. They, they're saying the same kind of thing. And it says, just look, look at the other, uh, recognize the yourself and the other. You, ha- you have a lot more in common than you have difference. You might think it's different. And you might say, well, I'm special and I'm my own unique individual. I understand all of that. But in the end, we're not really all that different. We're not, we're unique just like everybody else kind of thing. A little hyperbole, but recognize the humanness of the other. Recognize, recognize yourself. (laughs) You'll find yourself in the other if you look. It'll stare you right back in the face every time. That's all. Holy shit, Ed. <laughs> what? <laughs> that's, that's just how preach, I see it. Preach. 
<laughs> I'm not going to say, can I get a witness? Okay. <laughs> I, I, that, that's what I, that's what I heard her telling me anyhow. All right. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> All right. Any, any other, any last words? All right. No. Jeffrey's good. Mark's good. This is a good, good. this was a good cafe. This was Thanks. a good one. <laughs> I, I really enjoyed this one too. Thanks all for everybody for sure. Merry Christmas, guys. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. And have a good, as the Germans say, a good slide into the new year. A guten Rutsch. Okay. So, <laughs> most people don't make it standing up. <laughs> all right. We'll see you all. Um, see you on the other side. Yep. Okay. Take care, everyone.